And I will remind you that we'll have a panel discussion now with the participants of several representatives of the analytical centers and not only. And we will be speaking what's the perception of Ukraine abroad. The moderator of this panel will be Alim Aliyev, Deputy Director General of the Ukrainian Institute. Alim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irina. Good day, dear colleagues. Hello, dear audience. So, in fact, the previous panel discussion told us a lot about the soft power indices of Ukraine in the world. And as we can see, they are not that favorable as we would like them to be. So we are going on today with this conversation and we will be speaking about the image of Ukraine is formed today. What are our target audiences abroad? Is it worth it to correct and to strengthen or maybe to change the results and the outcomes of these images? And in any activities, including strategic activity of the Ukrainian Institute, we are using the research, we're using analytics as it gives us sustainability. Today, among our speakers, we've got rather well-known experts and analytics and also the heads of the centers, so I'm happily introducing them. Hennady Maksak, Executive Director of the Ukrainian Prism Foreign Policy Council. Alona Gitmanchuk, Director of the New Europe Center. Alexander Sushko, Executive Director of the International Renaissance Foundation. And we have Natalia Popovich in Zoom, the co-founder of Ukraine Crisis Media Center, founder of One Philosophy. Good day. So the first question would be rather short. I would like to pose it about what word is the main association, according to your expert opinion, of Ukraine at the audiences abroad? Who would like to begin? So I may begin that it's not that easy to unify all of the foreign audiences. And my view is that still in different audiences they have different associations as well as in different countries. We as the center of New Europe we are working in some of the countries of the EU not in all of them recently rather actively but still in Germany, Italy and France and even in those three countries, there can be different associations. In the United States, where we also have spent lots of efforts, the same. Besides that, there are different associations at the level of the societies in those countries and at the level of decision makers and those who are the influencers onto the decision makers. As for the societies, I may tell you more professionally, as we have ordered sociological surveys for the TNS Europe in 2015, where we've opened the question which concerned three key associations with the word Ukraine. And then three associations, one I wouldn't say that they are very nice, that is war, that is Russia, and that is poverty. This survey was conducted in three, in six key EU countries, the most populated EU countries. In particular, there, will be, there were the Netherlands there, it was before the referendum there, so these data were rather useful for us. So I'm really happy to announce that next week We'll present a kind of a follow-up of the Today's Forum. We'll present the new sociological research, which also was conducted by the TNS Europe, to look at the dynamics, what happened during the last five years. Because during the last five years, we've got lots of efforts of cultural diplomacy, both from the Ukrainian governmental institutions and analytical centers and NGOs 
That is why during the next week we'll get to know whether those three key associations, key Russia and poverty, stayed or they've changed. And we'll understand how we should go on working. This time we had an opportunity to conduct the sociological survey in the four countries of the EU, that is Germany, France, Italy, where we have been working a lot, that, so that's why it's interesting, and Poland as well. So it would be interesting to compare the opinions in those countries, what associations can be found there, besides other questions about Ukraine. As for the ones who are decision makers, who form the public opinion, we don't have the certain sociological research or an expert research, but still my experience of the work shows that among such circles, Ukraine is associated more with the fight. So this is the permanent fight, both internally with the corruption against the oligarchs, the fight against lots of other systematic griefs, and externally for our independence, for the sovereignty, for the temporarily occupied territories, for the international support. So it's a permanent fight. If we speak in the images, I can see that, especially in the United States of America, it was obvious that this was the image of the country a failure. But it's not always a bad failure. It's not always negative. You know, there are some characters in the movies, some positive failures. And finally, it ha works for them in the end of the film. But during the film, they always have lots of obstacles. And when it even seems that that's it, they finally achieved something, still they have some new obstacles emerging. So as I already said, in the end of the film, mostly we have a positive final. So I can see that those who are the professionals, who are the decision makers in our countries and partners with whom we are working, even if they say that uh, there is certain exhaustion of Ukraine about some disappointments and irritations, they did not forget about us. They still believe in us. And every time they think, and this time it will work. As in the well-known phrase, if everything is still not okay, then it's not the end. Thank you so much, Alexander, Henari, Natalia. Alexander, please. Well, I don't have anything to discuss and to debate anything, because I totally agree with what Alona says. I may say that at the different levels, if we sum up the dominating image of the latest five or six years, I don't have any quantitative indicators. I will tell you instantly, this is more of my observations. But still, my impression on the conflict with Russia, the conflict in this part of the world, it is dominating. When we speak about Ukraine, we speak about, as Alona says, the fight, the conflict. Someone names directly Russia as a factor. How Ukraine is perceived at the background against which Ukraine is counteracting, but still, if we speak about the audiences which to a certain extent were connected with Ukraine or some expectations are connected with Ukraine, there is a certain feeling, oh, that Ukraine again, or maybe this term like it is done like it's done in Ukraine, that is, creation of certain high expectations, but then not that nice implementation. Huge ambitions, but the implementation is not that good. This is what I've seen for multiple times in my audiences. But this is not representative, because it's more people who are more aware of the situation. The people who are, can be connect, connecting certain expectations with Ukraine. I'm always telling them that in such situations it's important to manage your expectations in a proper way, because the external world, with the democratic world, we have always an issue of overrated expectations. So Ukraine is always expecting more from the world than the world can give it. And the world is expecting more from Ukraine, that Ukraine cannot provide that quickly. And those are certain issues given birth, especially of the perception and long-term ones which we are dealing with 
Thank you, Hanari. Thank you, Alim. First of all, I'd like to thank for such a nice event. It's pleasant to stay offline here with you. We do understand it's not that often, but still, this discussion is rather useful. We also analyzed in the quantitative way how and which associations brought by Ukraine. But you asked about my own impression. Yes, subjectively. I would say that this is the world growth potential. Because if we just imagine it, it's a mirror which is just covered with steam. So you don't see this image. You need some additional flow or breath of air for this image to become clearer. So now it's rather vague, like Alona said. For the majority, there are certain moments when this picture is becoming clearer, but we don't have the wholesome understanding. And for rich audience, for the historical conditions of the development of this society, it should be a different message and different picture what Ukraine is. For us, it should be the potential for us to de really to grow and to understand that. And 30 years is the period when we just gain experience. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you for the question. Alim, do you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Okay. I'm happy to be with you at least like this, distantly, remotely, but together with you. For me, this is still the not implemented or realized dream, daydream, because I totally agree with the colleagues, depending on the certain audience, someone will be able to help and even to say what that daydream is. For instance, the more aware audience will tell that Ukrainians have partly already implemented the daydream about freedom, but maybe they have not implemented to the full extent their dream about dignity, for instance. So again, this is something not implemented, but unfortunately I'm sure there are lots of audiences who still don't know about our dreams and don't even guess about the details of the position position which we are for, standing for. Thank you. From our subjective impressions, I'd like to come closer to the objective results of the researches which you are conducting, lots of them. Our viewers, well, I'd like to remind you that you could ask your questions and also you should follow the news in the sphere of cultural diplomacy and the social networks pages of the Ukrainian Institute. Alona, I'd like to begin with you again. As for the researchers which you have already conducted, what they tell you? So, in fact, I just remembered the sociological survey which we have conducted and a different specter of our activity concerns cooperation with their analytical centers of the EU countries and the US. And I already mentioned that the focus was conducted during the last years on the cooperation of the analytical centers of Germany, France and Italy, because we considered that lots of points will depend on those countries in the context of our ambitions as for the EU and the context of our ambitions as for NATO and altogether the support of by the European Union in the context of Russian aggression and its deterrence, and also the sanctions issues, lots of issues. So, why it would be so important to provide that analytical support? And if we could provide these researchers to make them conjointly with the analytical centers of those countries, to present them together and to advocate them together. Of course, we could do that on our own. It would be much easier. We could define what we consider to be important for those countries and for the decision makers of those countries, for the societies, to prepare such a research, to go and to present it. If we have the resource, which is financial and human, it could be done. But still, we understood at some stage that the higher trust for our research could be in that would be much more efficient to do it together with the leading analytical centers in those countries. Well, of course, it was a very serious challenge as I'd say Ukraine is not that equally interesting for everybody. Moreover, Ukraine is not interesting always for everybody, for some of the audiences of certain countries. So, to have an initiative with any research, first we need 
to bring up trust with the analytical centers with which we had some wish to work together. Mostly those are the analytical centers number one and number two, or both number one and two and three, because we were working with all of the key centers in Italy, Germany and France. We had certain experience with the top three and in some countries with bigger number, for instance in Germany, because we had the higher demand and the request. And of course, we need to make an order the stable personal contact to make people interested in Ukraine, to form a new circle of experts who will deal with the issues of Ukraine on a daily basis. For those not to be the experts who are dealing with Russia and as a hobby they have sometimes issues of Ukraine dealing with. We would like them to be the experts who will be just interested in a systematic and a permanent basis to be dealing with Ukraine. And at some stage we mo mentioned that it was not that easy to do, because if they never visited Ukraine or visited Ukraine 20 years ago, and there were lots of cases like that, since 2014 we organized 14 training visits for their opinion leaders from the EU countries and the US to Ukraine, 2.53 days were devoted to the meetings, beginning with the presidents and ending with the civil society and the representatives of business and lots of other people. Unfortunately, now during COVID times, we had to cancel several visits like this, but it was one of our conclusions I'd like to share with you that it's really important for this deepening into the Ukrainian topic to take place with the visits to Ukraine, with the opportunity for them to come here, to communicate, to see with their own eyes the places where the events took place which they heard about on the TV. It's really important, incredibly important, but we need financial resource for that, especially if we need to invite the groups from the United States as we've organized. We had 100% American groups after Donald Trump won at the elections. That is why it's rather important for the people to be able to visit Ukraine. The second element is common analytical research. It's important to focus upon the request from this or that country we are working with, because we can offer certain topic, and we do offer, and we try to explain why it's important for Europe, for the United States of America, but still it would be much more efficient if, for instance, the government of Germany has a certain request for the research which concerns the help and support of Germany and the European Union in the decentralization issue. Yes, it's not our topic. It's not the topic our analytical center is dealing with, but still we are trying to satisfy this request for them to see that they also have a certain little success case in Ukraine, a German success story. If they don't have a success story in the court reform, at least it is in decentralization. So they can also promote those analysis and the authority representatives. So it's also important to focus upon the request which can be in those countries for the information which is needed from Ukraine. Because we are not the lobbyists, we are not the PR specialists, we are not the agents of the Ukrainian government. We are the people who can satisfy this or that need in this or that expertise, analysis, information, to make people know without any conjuncture and the, just to explain, to form the agenda which would be correspondent to our interests and our externally and foreign ambitions and aspirations of Ukraine. Thank you so much. I'd like to elaborate on your topic about the cooperation with the international analytical centers and other countries' international analytical centers, because sometimes it happens that they can study Russia, but they deal with Ukraine as a hobby. The International Fund of Vidrodzhenia had a separate program with Europe, where cooperation with the analytical and expert centers is one of the key directions of work. Thank you. I would say that 
the specter of issues which concerns public diplomacy, in particular the cultural diplomacy, it is going through to this or that extent lots of programs of the fund. It's not restricted by the work of our European program only, in particular. When several years ago we've launched in the cooperation with the Swedish government a huge program of the support of analytical centers, one of the components of the institutional development of those analytical centers were their capability to provide their products to the foreign audiences with the high quality. So we are happy that among our partners we've got the colleagues who are representing in particular two institutions like that who demonstrate such a capacity. But in fact there are other organizations during the last five years the overall capacity of the Ukrainian analytical centers to promote their product abroad is increasing. It's increasing though we always feel the lack, we want something better, we appoint higher, more ambitious aims and goals, but we understand that the progress is not done automatically there. It claims serious efforts, beginning with the studies of the audiences and its needs, studies of the starting level where we begin our work, up to the achievement of the certain outcome when we would like our partners from that side to perceive the messages which we bring and adjust their own actions and priorities according to those messages. So this is the super task which can never be solved finally but it's very important in this world for the country to have enough of the voices which know how to be heard. That is why if we speak about the foundation of Vidrodzhenya, in 2014 we've launched a rather huge spectre of projects which concern the promotion of the Ukrainian agenda in the world. And now, getting ready to this speech, I've decided to remind myself about the history or the legend of this project. And I looked how much was done in different trends. We just remembered about the analytical centers working with the most promoted, competent audiences and those which form the political decisions. But still, there is lots of work conducted at the various more peculiar and specific levels for the societies in the world to know better about Ukraine. So cultural diplomacy for us in this sense has always been the part of an overall integral strategy of the promotion of the message which the world would like to hear about. So lots of things have been done and discussions and strategic sessions and brainstormings to understand what and how we can do not to waste resources onto the less efficient things. Because altogether public diplomacy is rather expensive, any diplomacy is rather expensive. So under the conditions of the scarce resources it was always important to prioritize the points which are capable to lead to the highest effect. And it was done. Well, of course, now, looking back, we can say that there were lots of more successful or less successful projects. Somewhere we helped in the promotion of the Ukrainian interests and it changed the attitude we achieved certain results. For instance, I may remember the long history. The fund, since the beginning of the 2000s, was working with the topic of the European integration, and we were affiliated with the work of the expert international groups, within which we had the idea of our association agreement in the beginning of the 2000s. 
which we are now implementing. And also the idea of visa liberalization, because it was born somewhere, it looked just fantastic, but then we formed certain plans of actions, algorithms, support groups, advocacy projects, and all of that was combined into the vast picture, which was not that well noticed, if we take it overall. But still, it brought a certain effect, which was expected, which we planned in other cases. We may name the cases where we spent some efforts, but we could not implement it rather quickly, or we could not reach the result we wanted to. Because I remember how actively our civil activists were working in the Netherlands when they had that referendum about the association agreement, and we failed to change the societal opinion, because beforehand it was rather filled with fake arguments. At that stage it was just impossible to change it in such a short notice. But still, the that story really brought to higher interest towards Ukraine. And lots of audiences in that country got to know about Ukraine more than it was known before. So the can be lots of examples like that. It's obvious that every time we can see we give an opportunity for the civil society to show their initiative and we support the best projects in particular. In 2017 there was the competition for 2.5 million grivna to support the projects of cultural diplomacy and we had more than 20 projects supported, various ones, from the trip of art collectives to the serious analytical work, lots of various ones, but they all are unified into a certain orchestra and they're working together. There were forums of cultural diplomacy, which have been mentioned above since 2015, such Diplom Diplomatic Academy Forum was conducted with the help of the Canon Institute. We supported two of them and took part there. So there was the nice professional discussion held there, which finally was the base for the work which Ukrainian Institute is conducting now. And of course, I professionally really loved and what my colleagues are speaking about, that is the work with, on the promotion of the certain analytical product, advocacy, the work with the key political audiences and intellectual and media audiences and the universities. So this is, that's what helps the formation. We are trying to help our partners to form their policy about us, for it to be correspondent to the synergy feeling, to have the bilateral or multilateral relationship out of the null-sum game, where we can see the cliched approach that if one side is achieving, the other one is losing. But we are trying to promote the win-win philosophy, when really the promotion of the Ukrainian interests abroad means the better opportunity for the implementation of the interests of our partners. And sometimes it is working, sometimes not that much. So we've piled up rather substantial experience to make certain conclusions, to see where it was working, where it was not that much. Which recommendations can be given to those who are beginning this work and is trying to do something? So I think that we are on the right way now. But if I say about the overall impressions and basic recommendations, we need to understand, first of all, what was done before us, we shouldn't begin the work there thinking that we are the first here and we need to build something up from scratch. In fact, lots of things have been done and we need to get the lessons from the existing experience. Secondly, it's always very important to create partnership. 
So even if you have the best message coming into a certain new audience for you, and even if you properly constructed your message, but you didn't deal with the communication and to involve local partners for the test and common development of certain messages, you will never have the proper effect. The best works I've been involved in, beginning with the end of the 90s, and what I already mentioned above on the formation of the EU policy about Ukraine on the visa liberalization, those efforts had effect where Ukraine did not look the party which is just asking or begging. We were always involving and cooperating with the local communities of policymakers, journalists and experts, the opinion leaders, who were proposing similar ideas. So those proposals, those requirements which were addressed to the local political systems, they did not come from beyond. So the pressure or the proposals or the political analysis of the assessment was considering the local analytical centers and media. So we were equal partners there, and in this situation, those proposals were easily perceived because they were instantly given like the ones which take into consideration national interests of this or that country or the group of countries which we're speaking about. It's really important, and by the way, it's also important from the perspective of the political language of the country where you are working. Because when you come with your own vocabulary, with your own notions, and your own system of definitions and coordinates, and it seems to you that your picture of the world is so logical, it may turn out that they have a bit of a different picture of the world, and the different arguments is working, and what seems to be a perfect argument for you may not work at all. So you need to study all of that before you begin the active work, understanding what, when and how it is working and how it is done by the others. So how can you foresee the reaction? So that is why we are going on with this work in various formats. It's obvious that now the situation is much better, honestly speaking. Because ten years ago, just to say that the state needs to be involved, we could speak about that. But it would be just knocking the wall. Yes, now the state has been involved. They created certain institutions. Well, of course, we are always short of money, but still we are at the different step now. And there are certain expectations that this work will bring its own results still. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I would like to give the floor to Natalia now as for the researchers which you are conducting, they concern the historical narratives and media narratives. Please, Natalia. Thank you, Alim. Uh, well, these topics really resonate deep with me, both the topics of Alexander and Alona, because really, the researchers are really important to be conducted together. That is how they can have higher credibility and they help us in the protection of our national interests. So they create the dialogue where we can protect it in a consistent way. And what Alexander said from the perspective of the promotion of the Ukrainian agenda in the world, through the political expert and media circles. We can do that in a very different way, so I'm really happy that the Vidrogenia Foundation has supported the Ukrainian Crisis Media Center since the very first day in lots of our initiatives, in particular one of the research initiatives which we have conducted with our Estonian colleagues from the Analytical Center of Estonia, where we faced such a challenge where the, our European partners were not as easy to understand why we are emphasizing that on Russia and what's our attitude towards those threats of disinformation from the Russian Federation. According to the example of Ukraine, in our context it was not that easy to break this wall of misunderstanding and to assure our colleagues that we need to be more cautious about Russia. So 
we decided to conduct a very high-scale research of the EU image, EU community and values in three years at three top th Russian TV channels. And we found out huge gaps in how the Europeans consider themselves in the Russian eyes and vice versa in the Kremlin narrative every day. So it brought us some basics for some of the full of sense conversations during lots of years with our international partners about this gap between this perception and what it can be done with that. And now in the work we've got several important initiatives which were implemented for to counteract Russian values and ideals. Because if we speak today about the pandemic and post-pandemic world, in the world of commerce, the successful brands are the ones which don't have positioning but have some position and stand up for their position. In the world of the public diplomacy, the successful are the countries which create, which co-create, who communicate and they provide certain protection to the values. And the other project I'd like to mention in more details today in the context of the discussion of the analytical work is the research which last year was conducted by One Philosophy and the Ukrainian Institute to look which discrepancies can be found in the interpreting of the different historical narratives of the 20th century in certain European countries to understand in which context we need to have certain efforts of the Ukrainian public diplomacy where we should focus upon our restriction uh, in the resources, our scarce resources. So I would say that we should try more testing and then using because lots of strategic works have to be created according to the researchers. Why did we decide to look at the historical narratives of the 20th century? Because different interpretations of our past mostly lead to either absence or complications because you don't, you don't see the common European future but just to create some of the unifying principles which are important for the future if ukraine wants to play the more powerful role in europe before trying to make an order this dialogue and to conduct it it's important to understand where we are where we interpret these the that phenomena of the 20th century in comparison with the countries which are significant for us so we looked at those historical events and phenomena in the context whether they are mentioned or not about Ukraine. And we do understand that for the identity of each country as we are interacting, that there are certain milestones which formed it. Well, of course, we could look at the past times and to look at the Kiev and Rus, but we still decided that the events of the 20th century seriously impacted on who we are, the Ukrainians, who the Europeans are, who the Russians are today, and we wanted to understand how the key narratives about the historical events of the 20th century, which were highlighted in the media in 2018 and 19, to see how Ukraine is mentioned there and whether those narratives are close to us. We've ordered this research in the Corstone company which analyzed 7,342 editions of the six countries Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Germany, France and the UK and we've researched the frequency subcontext, uh, the framework of the narratives of the 20th century in the most influential medias in The Commerçant, The Economist, Gazette de Borcha, or Le Figaro. And uh, this was the context and the content analysis considering uh, the editing office policies. And uh, among the topics we've considered, we looked at the topics which form ourselves and are cross-secting with the topics which could be from factoring for other um, markets. In the Ukrainian context, we were interested in the famine, Holodomor. We were interested by the perception or non-perception of the Ukrainian avant-garde and the re 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 renaissance. In the global accent, the Second World War and the Pact of Ribbentrop-Molotov and the re reflections about the Yalta conference and also the Chernobyl disaster. And this is the tendency of the democratization after 1991 at the post-Soviet territory, how it is perceived and analyzed and 
acknowledged by the media of these years. We also chose those topics how the media impacts how Ukraine is perceived as a separate or not separate political, historical and cultural space abroad. We also took into account that the political and cultural events, the elections, anniversaries, or maybe publishing of the book can coincide with the peaks of the media publications in all of the above-mentioned countries, because this constitutionalization is really playing a great role in the understanding how the external factors can help improve the relevance of certain topics during the researched periods. In the report, we have taken into account rather a editing policies and the political orientations of the media to analyze and to take decisions according to this report and for this research to be easier to interpret these or those quotes and a couple of words a couple of words about the insights from this research I will share with you the, that the first important moment is that the name, the branding of the events and phenomena really matters. One Australian journalist from The Guardian writes that he hopes that once in Australia um, they will be speaking with the nationally n acknowledged notions uh, which was which will be working about the crimes with um, um, uh, Australian origins and it would be as it is already done with the Israeli Holocaust or Ukrainian Holodomor and among them we have the Ukrainian avant-garde or the Renaissance which is still not that known at the international arena and not comprehensible for the media of other countries. Secondly, the anniversaries matter because really anniversaries drive your attention, substantial attentions to the datas and it's important to have the strategic planning of the Ukrainian cultural institutions, which sometimes involve lots of resources, but still, how can we create this rethinking of Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact as the pact which opened the door to the hell, citing the times, for it to, in fact, provoke the rethinking as it's done in the Nord Stream 2. In this context, in the contract, we are impressed by the lack of the publications and the rethinking of the topics of the Second World War. Natalia, I do apologize. There is one request. Would you speak a bit slower? Because we have a simultaneous interpretation. The interpreters are just trying to catch up with you. Okay, thank you that you remind reminded about the interpretation. So, in this case, really, there is a certain lack of the deeper understanding of other consequences of the Second World War, like the impact sphere after the Yalta Conference, and we really noticed the lack of the acknowledgement of the oppression movements and dissidence movements of the post-Soviet countries. The third important moment to take into consideration that the popular culture really impacts which topics are getting into the attention span of the millions of the people at the certain information markets. And during this analyzed periods, we could see that the appearance uh, of uh, the Chernobyl book of Sergei Plohi and HBO movie Chernobyl and the Price of Truth by Agnieszka Holland, the movie about Holodomor, are all the reasons without which the publications about the rethinking of the topics of Chernobyl or Holodomor could not be that substantial and noticeable. And of course, thanks to those reflections in the popular culture or publicist work, we had such a positive provocation to reconsider the Russian context where both tragedies have become possible. The fourth important moment is that the top persons of the country in their attitude towards the phenomena and events really have huge significance for the media context. For instance, the number of publications about the Holodomor has the difference between the presidency of Poroshenko and Zelensky. Still, the Price of the Truth movie was um, shown during the presidency of President Zelensky. So the communication of the first people of the country can provoke both international highlighting, like the response of the Russian media onto the social media greeting of the President of Ukraine, considering the birth date and anniversary date of Kazimir Malevich and his acknowledgement as the Ukrainian artist. A very important moment is that if we ourselves don't analyze or acknowledge something inside of the country, we shouldn't await for that from others. 
In Ukraine, during the researched period, we had fewer than 20 publications where there would be the mentions of someone else of the Ukrainian avant-garde besides Dovzhenko and Malevich. Moreover, even them, the Ukrainian media do not identify as the representatives of the Ukrainian avant-garde movement. So we still are surprised how it's complicated to identify Ukrainian artists, for them not to be identified as the representatives of the Russian avant-garde. So a very important moment which I could... Natalia. Well, in fact, we are short of time. So for us to have enough time to have another circle of questions. Okay, I will mention one more important point, that the research is analyzing the taboo topics which are still not rethought by our European partners, which, for instance, gives the pass to Russia in the context of the Second World War to pay attention to the Munich plot, that is, the under-analyzed, the inconvenient legacy of the reconciliation policy from France and Britain. These, those are the topics where you need to organize more common conversations and discussions, because their identification will become them more powerful, will be, will make them more powerful who wants to manipulate those tragic topics. A very interesting layer was in the result of this research. I think it would be rather informative for decision makers in lots of the Ukrainian cultural institutions, not only Ukrainian Institute. Thank you so much, Gennady. The question is the same to you about the researches which are conducted together with the Ukrainian Institute and the Foundation of Vidrodzhenia about the perception of Ukraine abroad. If I may, I would begin that I can feel myself really, really raised and inspired because I am with my colleagues, but simultaneously I'm very sad. I could listen by hours for you, but all of the thesis are perceived positively. I will try to decompose a bit the whole system of relationship. Public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, as I could see, this is the diplomacy with a certain tool. We are communicating some idea to the society, to the government, so we can see a huge circle with little to semicircles which are connected with the straws. We have ourselves as the subject which conducts a certain idea, a certain sense. We have someone who is perceiving there are the straws or the channels of information and there is the environment. In the Ukrainian prism we try to have the comprehensive approach and to analyze all of the moments because they are important. Even the most kind-hearted intentions and some ideas about the ongoing reforms are not taking place in the vacuum. And what Alona said, that we are the poor country with the corruption, with the war, it happens because someone provides the negative ideas about us than the positives. So I can remember the joke when two guys are just communicating and they say, he said, he's, I've heard Pavarotti, well, because uh, he, he's not that such a nice singer. Uh, but where did you hear Pavarotti? Well, my friend just sang a bit of his song. So, I have a nice project, the Index of Stability Towards Information, which narratives are ongoing, which of them are produced by Russia, which Eastern Partnership or Central European countries are perceiving it, and can we work to perceive positively what's ongoing in those countries, our positive narratives. If we speak about the result, it's really important for us to understand what is ongoing in Ukraine, whether it should be the cultural context, how we make it known, or it should be some different context. So we really look at the societies, how it is ongoing, how we created it together with the Ukrainian Institute. It was a kind of a synergy project, because in fact, we fund this project by the Fund of Bidrogen, and we create ad hoc expertise for the authorities in Ukraine for the external politic political topics. So Ukrainian Institute came to us with the three proposals about the perception of Ukraine by Poland, France and Germany. So in fact, so far, those are the 
addresses, how we need to work, which points we should create to focus onto this airflow to create this clearer picture, who we are, what we are. In the Ukrainian prism, we have a very strategic vision that we'd like to see our authorities as the clock which is working for the appointed task. And the Ukrainian Institute and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Parliament and other institutions need to communicate with each other and to have a strategic approach to all of those issues. We have the document, the annual analysis where we analyze the 50 external policy directions among which we have the public cultural diplomacy we look whether we have political will we whether we have strategic vision coordination what is done and what has been achieved so i think that this self analysis gives us an opportunity to understand what is working not that potentially how it could work with the better conditions. So I think that we are helping our partners here to understand where and how we can work. What Alexander said, we are going on with this idea with the support of the Foundation of Hydrogenia. We are helping the Ministry of Inter uh, Foreign Affairs to create the circle of expert forums of Ukraine with Germany. So Germany is a bit of a different sphere and the learner is dealing with that more. Poland, Hungary, Slovakia and even Belarus, Romania. The countries with whom we need to share opinions and we need to speak about because the experts know more, but you can't you won't believe that you can hear so much things from the experts that I think those platforms are very important to promote this info. And of course, when we understand ourselves, we look at those channels, at those draws, and we have separate researchers where we analyze the expert diplomacy and public diplomacy, what of the available channels is working better or worse and maybe the experience of other countries can help us to form it thank you so much dear colleagues our panel discussion is coming to its end but before that i cannot help myself i would ask one more question which factors are helping to change this perception of the country abroad just a minute, a minute and a half for each of you. First of all is the positive picture in the media of the country we're speaking about. So the factors which have really changed the perception are the media represented events in Ukraine which resonate from with the positive moods or expectations of the majority of the citizens of this country. That is why the Orange Revolution of 2004 and the Revolution of Dignity, they have resonated in the democratic world with the moods of the majority, which helped and supported the change for the better of the perception of Ukraine in those countries. As for systematic points which are not connected with the revolutionary events, we may not say that we will move in those leaps. So, of course, here we're speaking about the information picture or those products which suit the audiences. Beginning with the traditionally sports, which was the factor to form positive attitude. There are lots of examples of that. But also, for instance, we've had much more of cultural product sold, that is both literature and uh, cinematography, which begins to flourish because there is more of it in Ukraine. It improves its quality and gradually this factor also begins to work. A certain factor is the present of the Ukrainians or the people of Ukrainian origin in this or that country where they have certain positive impact in different levels from the market of the labor market from lots of countries Ukrainians really can substantially add to the growth of local economies. Not everybody knows about that, but where we have it, it really impresses. It may impress up to the high level 
of the people, representatives of creative professions and business who are from Ukraine originally and who are working in the countries changing this attitude. That is why all of that together should work. Thank you, Alona, please. Alim, you've asked about the positive or negative perception, about the positive, just positive factors which are impacting, because a very serious factor is, of course, the situation in Ukraine itself. What is ongoing here, which processes are happening here, because otherwise we could have really cool PR strategies and communication strategies, but in fact, if you don't have the arguments, you don't have anything for the discussion and debates that Ukraine really has the huge potential. Well, I don't like this phrase, in fact, because we are repeating it for lots of years, in fact, and we cannot implement it, in fact. But still, if you don't have such arguments, whatever you say will sound as the kind of a propaganda style in lots of countries. It won't be that easy to communicate. As for the positive points, the positive factors, Alexander was really reasonable to mention media. And again, I will mention the necessity to work with the analytical centers as, as they impact the authorities, the political establishment of those countries as the EU countries have the leading analytical centers where we're working are funded by the government and in fact they're developing the recommendations and analytics according to the request of the government and certain institutions and ministries according to their recommendation they form lots of policies lots of decisions about Ukraine in particular we are working with those centers, and those analytical centers impact the media picture because they are present. Those are the people who are commenting everything which concerns Ukraine in the media. They provide the intonation. They give the comments to the journalists. It's incredibly important to do it, but to do it on a permanent basis, in a systematic approach, because during the last six years, we formed the circle of more than 200 opinion leaders from the US and the EU, and we need to work with them definitely. Dotty measures won't work. We need systematic work, and we need human resource for that. We cannot work project to project. The project is over, and we are not working anymore. Thank you so much. Gennady, please. One rich man was asked, you are spending so much money for the advertising, why? Well, he's answered, I do understand that half of this money is not working, but which half is not working, I don't know, so I'm spending two times more. So if I just translate it into our topic, this should be a long-term race. We need to understand that this is the long way, and we need to go along that. We shouldn't have such a project approach. This is the long money. Something will not be working. Something will be worse. Something will be better. But if we have this air flow into the mirror, we'll see this image not that vague. Natalia, please. I would say several points. If we can provide the better cooperation and coordination between the Ukrainian institutions, it may help to calibrate the resources. For instance, if the Ukrainian Cultural Fund supports the Covenant of Ukraine, it would be logical for the Ukrainian Institute or other similar institutions to help the promotion of the content of the Covenant at the international um, culture in the context of our Shedrick and other high-quality things developed. In, the, in Denmark, for instance, we have 10 leading cultural state institutions which coordinate their activities and what they deal with. The second point is not to be afraid the broader mission of cultural and cultural diplomatic institutions, because to solve the Ukrainian issues is the task of Ukraine. But to give us what we deserve when the Ukrainian institutions not only solve the issues of Ukraine, but they solve the global issues. Could it be sustainable development or the welfare or inequality issues or rather global issues? Then we have higher chances to take this subject 
subjective participants in this dialogue. And going on with what was mentioned above, what is really working are the international projects, that is sponsorship, some of the internships, the creation of international residences, where some of the authors writing about, but where in the collaboration between the Ukrainian researchers, experts, producers, theologists, philosophers, historians, we have certain senses which allows us to create certain common new history of Europe or the world. That is why funding and investing of the resources into this common word work is a very important, a long one, but the most efficient in the long-term perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear speakers. Thank you, our audience, which is staying with us and is following the opinions and ideas and discussions at the International Cultural Diplomacy Forum, I'd like to remind you that the Ukrainian Institute, together with the partners during the next months, will present lots of interesting, important researches, including the perception of Ukraine abroad.